Welcome back to the Dropping In Surf Show where we talk about math and science and a little bit of math and science and a lot of surfing or we try to. Sometimes we get a little distracted off on a tangent, but that is a mathematical term, so I'm going to count that one. My name is Rob Case. I am a paddling technique coach. You can check out all the services that I provide at surfingpiling.com. Uh, I am filming from Belmar and Keys, California. Today is June 17th, and with me uh, is my co-host, who is a doctor of physical therapy, Jim Segalnik, who's being recorded in Greenbrae, California. Welcome, Jim. Thanks, Rob. Yep, we, we've, uh, we've kind of been slacking. We missed a week, and uh, <laughs> you, the word tangent took me back to like, uh, pre-algebra, remember Soka Toa? Oh, yeah. You remember? Oh, yeah. It, I had a teacher that called it um, some old hippie, some old hag called a hippie tripping on acid. <laughs> right? So tangent would be tripping on acid. So tripping on acid. What is it? It's uh, something over O over yeah. A, whatever that yeah. is. It's uh, opposite over adjacent for right angles. Yeah. There you go. Or right triangles. You know what's really odd about what you just said is that I have Sokotoa written on my notes right here. You are officially the weirdest person of all time. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't I haven't made a Sokotoa reference since like ninety five, man. Oh uh, dude, it's it comes back. It comes back to you. Yep. And it haunts your nightmares. <laughs> that sounds awful yeah yeah actually i had written all these notes and i have all these like scratch outs because i had a topic today that I, I was thinking i might i might talk about but i think i'm going to reserve it because i'm still working out the math on it okay. um but uh we over the last two weeks because we couldn't like i felt like probably the listeners are like yeah, I could do without a week. Or some of them are like, yeah, they're not really that serious. But seriously, we are serious about doing this every week when we can. We just got super busy, like life. So Yeah, you know, I, I guess we can't ignore the possibility of uh, um, dropping in show fatigue syndrome. <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, no, uh, we're serious and uh, we love questions. Um, they facilitate conversation and um, selfishly, it's just a lot of fun, I think, for Rob and I to have an excuse to get together and talk about stuff maybe people aren't talking about in yeah. the surfing world. So yeah. It's really cool. And I, I think the last time we recorded, it was funny because we recorded in the morning and then we did our bike surf adventure in the afternoon. And uh, you'd commented, uh, your wife was like, wait a minute, wait a minute. You're hanging out with Rob in the morning and then you're going on this adventure in the afternoon. Yeah, that's why we had to take a week off actually, folks. Uh yeah. we had to we had to like take a break from each other just uh just so my wife wouldn't divorce me. Spent... <laughs> and she wouldn't hate me to death. Yeah, <laughs> cuz I spent too much time one day with Rob. Yeah, <laughs> one day, one day. No, uh we missed a week, but um yeah, that was uh that was an awesome day, not only cuz we did the podcast, but uh uh we did a couple novel things. We biked into our local surfing spot which we never do yeah. uh, which i've been doing but that was your first time yeah. and that was your first surfboard session back in the water yeah since surf your ocean, first ocean session back, right which was awesome yeah i felt really how cool. did yeah how, tell us about it what what did you feel did you feel I'm, shaky uh, did you feel confident I kind of I set the bar so low that <laughs> everything exceeded it, which was great. Uh, I'm really, really glad that I got some time behind the boat first, though, because I, yeah. I I told you I had that one session behind the boat and it kind of cracked all those those bones and muscles and just kind of loosened everything up. Had I not done that, my my whole surf session probably in the ocean probably would have been just trying to get comfortable in that back foot. Uh, but I had, yeah. I had a great time. It was so much fun. And um, I had saddle butt the next day, thanks to Jim. Because Jim, so here's the thing. Like, Jim, Jim, you've been doing it for a few weeks before that. And mm -hmm. what you didn't tell me is that you bike to work. So, you know, when I wasn't, re like, ready for this. I know it was going to be a long distance. We were gonna, It was going to be awkward with the surfboards. But I... You know, I prepped my bike helmet. I got my running shoes on, you know, and I 
I put shorts and like a, a short sleeve shirt thinking I'm going to warm up. It's going to be windy and cold, but I'm going to do this, right? So mm-hmm. we park and then I grab everything out of the car, get ready, and I meet up with you. And not even like 20 seconds later, you come rolling around and you got your your bag hung on your shoulder and you've got this almost like a – it's like a road bike, right? What did you call it? Like a cross bike? Yeah, it's a, it's a cross bike. Cross bike. Right? Yeah, so, it's like a it's like a hybrid. It goes on dirt, but yeah, it's it's more or less a road bike. Yeah, but you've got those, uh, you know, you got the the road bike handlebars, right? Mm-hmm. So I I had chosen my wife's bike because my commuter bike's trashed right now, and I'm not taking my racing bike. Uh, and so he pulls up, <laughs> and he's got jeans on, a long sleeve tee with a hoodie, his bag slung over his shoulder, and he's wearing sandals. And I'm like, oh. Sh- Well, this is going to be easy, right? But what Jim didn't tell me is that, of course, he's been basically biking. How long is your bike to work? Yeah, so it's probably 10, 12 miles uh, with all the back roads and stuff. It takes about 40, 45 minutes door to door. And how often were you doing that or are you doing that? Well, I, it's from Green Bay to Santa Fe at Kaiser. Yeah. Um, so that's, uh, I've been doing that. I used to do it more in the past, but kind of like reinstilled it when um, pretty much the whole shelter in place yeah. took, took, took place. Um, so probably about 15 some odd weeks now I've been going <laughs> two or two sometimes, yeah, two or three times a week on average. Yeah. Yeah. So here comes my guide and, and. It, the first picture of him is like flip-flops and jeans, and I'm like, oh, I got this. No problem. But then, you know, you, you, you've you seen the guys out, and maybe the listeners have seen the guys, and, and some of you might be the cyclists that, like, get all decked out, right? They've got the pedal shoes. they got their team shorts on, like neoprene or latex or whatever it is all over them, and it's like maybe a bike shop jersey. And they got their goo packets and their waters in there. And they're like serious bikers, right? So this guy Mm -hmm. cruises by us in the quote-unquote bike lane, which there really was none. There was just basically a sign on the ground that said, share the road, which nobody shares the road. And this guy cruises past. I link up with Jim. He's like, you ready? I was like, yeah, let's do this. And so he takes off. And immediately we're in this like slow uphill. And this guy on the side, on this nice, road bike just cruising right and jim's like what's up bro and he totally passed him like like the guy was like standing still and he and jim's slinging his his board bag with his sandals and his jeans and this guy i just can't imagine what this guy was thinking when he saw you pass him on this uphill yeah Yeah. (laughs) with all my gear and like how um like I guess it was just a disrespectful thing for me to do. Like, like he, he takes biking very seriously, right? He's in the spandex. He's in the jersey. He's got all the stuff, like the $10,000 bike. And I have a $400 bike that's built in the late 80s, made of steel, jeans, flip-flops, and a <laughs> giant surfboard bag flopping in the wind. And I crushed him up the hill. Crushed him, dude. <laughs> so as I saw that, I'm like, oh, crap. I'm in for because Jim's like, oh yeah, it'll take like 20 minutes. I'm like, oh no, yeah. this is not going to be a 20 minute ride, and it's yeah. <laughs> you, you didn't you didn't realize you were dealing with a ringer, did you? No, not at all, <laughs> not at all, not at all. Yeah. But it was it was the a great day. It was one of my favorite days of the month. Um, and like I said to you, I'm gonna try to reserve a day or two a month just to do something like that. Bike in, even though the lot's open now, um, because. Once we got through to the, you know, the open area, gosh, it was amazing to, to bike through that. So, yeah, yeah. Super special. Like, and we've talked a little bit about this, but, uh, like if you can get that sense of adventure in your backyard and you don't have to travel or fly or whatever, I mean, like take advantage of that, right? Like we live in such a beautiful area and there was a moment where I think we were getting some water or something where we stopped and I said, dude, just, just listen to how still that is right and like never never in 20 years could you do that there unless you drove out there at like night or four in the morning or something but like something super special and yeah uh all you heard was the wind all you heard was Mm -hmm. the wind and like you know the uh, it was just incredible and and i think the 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 extra part of it was that we cruised up 
and we put our bikes on the beach. We kind of set up camp, and that whole kind of uh, that whole sequence of setting up camp, putting our wetsuits on, checking the waves, it kind of gets lost when you pull up in your car, right? Because mm-hmm. in your car, mm-hmm. you're kind of like you're at your car. We, I know at our spot, we have kind of a sense of community, and so we kind of chit chat and hang out sometimes. But when you bike in. Even, you know, with the lot open, when we bike in, we can set up camp, we can hang out, we get this kind of camaraderie. And I was even talking mm-hmm. to some guys this morning, because I went surf there this morning. And, oh, you did? Uh, cool. Yeah, and, and I was talking about, um, you know, how many people biked in? Because I'm sure at, a whole bunch of people did, you know, throughout the last couple of weeks. And sure enough, everyone I was talking to was like, yeah, man, I tried it once. And then some people were like going every day and... Mm-hmm. Um, you know, they're on the e-bike wagon with you mm-hmm. and, mm-hmm. uh, and they're all in and I think it's great. I think, uh, and then maybe that's something unique to us, but I look at, I was thinking about it this morning when I was driving back and, and lowers kind of has that vibe, right? So you have yep. to hike or bike in or, or skateboard or whatever. And you set up camp on the beach while you're waiting for the waves and you kind of just, you get this nice natural flow of everything and it's nice and relaxed and you got to have all the time in the world. Whereas, you know, sometimes at our break, you know, because I go early, I go with the kind of the work crowd, you know, people come in, they, they bum rush the parking lot, they grab their wetsuit, they don't even check the waves really, they run out there, they're rushing to get as many waves as they possibly can and then they're back out and then gone. And it's like that whole sequence, it's like, yeah, how enjoyable really was that for them? Yeah, Yeah, you know, I I think I've been doing the same kind of reflection over these last three months or so with, you know, we're working, I guess, kind of out of shelter in place now. But it's like, do I enjoy like more days that are more frantic because I have all these other responsibilities where it's like I'm looking at my watch the whole time like okay I got to get out of the water by this time to get back to do that thing or whatever or would I rather just kind of like peg out time where I can be a bit more relaxed about the whole thing knowing like it's going to take a while and um yeah I would say it's it's more enjoyable for sure for me Um, But I guess there is pros and cons of both. Like, you know, you probably get more reps in if you get more days out there. Um, But yeah, just the the general enjoyment factor, I think, is um, it's much higher when you have to kind of work for it. It'd be kind of like, you know, going to a grocery store and buying food versus like growing your own food or, you know, providing for yourself in that, you know, sense. It's like, it's harder work it takes more time and prep there's more gear involved more um planning but when it all pays off it's like man there's nothing more satiating than like doing things uh that don't use fossil fuel or you know burn energy and it's like you know that's great yeah so a question for you then is you know now that the lot's open and i i you know i drove in um and parked um With, with the lot open, I know you're getting your e-bike. You're going to be biking in every once in a while. Do you think you're going to get the same satisfaction pulling up to a break that has like 20 guys on it already versus when we pulled up and it was complete desolation? <laughs> yeah, you know, probably not. Like, you know, I've, I've had a handful of sessions at Ocean Beach since they've opened the parking lots there four weeks ago or something. And it's like, you know, Ocean Beach is not what it was prior. It's definitely not as crowded, um, but you, there are those little pockets where there's 20 guys on a peak or something. And uh, but yeah, to to keep it simple, um, no, I don't think for me. Like the older I get, the more I really, really enjoy those experiences that kind of connect us to nature. Like you know, we chatted about our Gazos trip. We shared on here in the middle of nowhere. We had very low expectations but yet we scored this amazing surf like to me that's like what it's all about yeah. you know I, I would much rather like seek out those local experiences versus like you know and i'd still love to go to indonesia on a boat trip but like have this like premeditated thing that i hype myself up for for a year and it turns out to be average and then i'm like feeling disappointed you know but um yeah i guess that's just like a you know a way of it's a lens of 
looking through to you know for general life you know like like what can you do in the day to day to appreciate the moment and um make get the most enjoyment out of it yeah yeah and i i I had to think on that today same question uh of whether or not i would enjoy it that much if i rolled up having biked in and putting all the work in and then it was as crowded as as it was this morning with all the boys out right and you know you're like oh great i gotta like hassle for waves now but um I, I don't know. To be honest, I totally think that I would still appreciate it. I think I'm going to have to try it to see yeah, try it. how I actually feel about it. Like if I'm yeah. going to be, if I'm going to pull up and be like, oh, I did all this work, you know, and these guys just yeah. rolled up, you know, or if I'm going to be like, dude, that, I just feel good. You know, like you're warmed mm-hmm. up. You, you Like you said, you connected nature. And, and of course, it, it totally helps when you're cruising through national parkland on your way to the surf spot. I think it might be feel different if you're cruising through city streets and then you rolled up sort of thing. Mm-hmm. There's something special about spot X, you know, just beyond. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, it'd be interesting to kind of rehash this conversation that in a few months when you've had maybe a handful <laughs> of times and you're like, you know, all that stuff, never mind. I got stuck in traffic on the way back. And, <laughs> yeah, totally. You know. <laughs> yeah. Well, and you're yeah. you're within striking distance that you can actually step out your front door and yeah. rock it with the e-bike, whereas I'm outside that range, even with an e-bike. I mean, I guess in an e-bike I could. You, you could do it with an e-bike because you're my, probably like my place. It's not that 20, 20 something miles maybe from your right, house. Right, but the the way to get there is less pleasant. Like there's not yeah. back roads. At some point I would have to highway it um, mm-hmm. even for a short period of time. I'm trying to think of how I would get through each of the like cities to get down there. Uh, yeah. Center, Center Fell being one of the biggest ones that I I'd have to somehow navigate s- carefully. But. Well, Marin, Marin. So I go through downtown Center Fell when I commute to work, and like you know, uh, just uh, less than five years ago, they put a tunnel through one of the mountains, and um, they've made it a bit more bike friendly. There's another bike path along the freeway. Which, so like, wait, which mountain? The one that that separates Cordillera and and Center Fell? Yeah, Larkspur and Center Fell, right okay. by. Yeah, so they did that um, with the plans of putting in that smart train that goes there. And so there's a whole walking bike path. So I can pretty much get from my house to uh, downtown Centerfell before I, you know, have to touch a street, which is pretty cool. And so um, I could probably get to Kaiser, barely seeing a car once I get on uh, the bike path. And then to get to your house, there are kind of like back roads that you would have to research, but like. Yeah. Like if we sat down with a map, I want to say you could probably do it on an e-bike, maybe maybe an hour and a half from your house. I would guess an hour. I don't know. I, I don't have an e-bike yet, so I'll start. My neighbor sells e-bikes, and he 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 uh, he reckons I can get from my house to uh, Spot X in like forty minutes. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. It took it took me almost two hours. So that first day I rode into Spot X, um, I did my you know normal pedal bicycle uh yeah. from my house there and um and that was almost two hours with the board and uh yeah. it felt like 10 hours on the way back but it was probably about the same right. but like when you're fatigued and tired and grumpy like you know i want to see my neighbors when i start pulling out with the surfboard locked in inside of an e-bike they're probably like where is he going like is he <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly totally. yeah that'll be a fun conversation yeah i have a couple of my coworkers know i'm like getting an e-bike and uh i plan on just fixing a surfboard rack to it and it'll be interesting when i'm like taking that thing to work and the surfboard rack is like on it and i'm parking it in the common room they're gonna be like what the hell we knew jim was a psychopath but what the <laughs> You know, like, <laughs> what's this guy doing? <laughs> oh, that's great, man. Yeah, yeah. thank you for uh, for being the guide. I, I appreciate it. We got to do more of that. And, mm-hmm. you know, it's just a matter of, of uh, negotiating the, the, the whole day to not have to rush and have those kinds of moments. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. So you highly gotta... recommended to people to, to go out and get in nature and, and try to get to the beach with your board and wetsuit. Uh, you know, in the natural way, I guess you could say. Yeah. 
Um, yeah, and thank you, thank you for having a like such an open mind and and having fun with it. You know, I got home and, and and Trish, my wife, was like, "So how was it? Like, you know, how was it? How did Rob do surfing?" And I was like, "You know, like part of the coolest thing." And and, and I don't know if you kind of like get this feedback at all, but I'll give it to you. Like, the coolest thing about doing that with you is you were so like open minded and like knowing it was kind of a pain in the ass and. Like, you're just like, this is like awesome. Like, and I love that energy. It's just so like an in the moment appreciation of like simple things. And um, so like, yeah, so thank you for bringing that energy. It was a pleasure to do it with you. And um, and second off, like, had I not known any different, I wouldn't have thought you had been out of the water for six months. Like, I think it was your second wave. You clicked a top turn. I was like, what? I've already fallen four times. <laughs> you know, so yeah, it was really impressive to see like how well um, you came back. Like, like I would have imagined myself so rusty after that much time. Like, you know, I, I, I dealt with a hip issue that kept me out of the water for a little bit. Not as long as you were, but like, you know, that's a testament to maybe your your maybe muscle memory if you want to call it that and your training and rehab you put in and just like how good of a athlete you are so good job on that man thanks man thanks i can't uh, say any more than thanks man before my head gets too big there i appreciate that feedback i uh yeah. i just was trying to have fun and that's kind of at the end of the day it was easy i think you had mentioned on the way back you said, "Yeah, this is this isn't taking as long. It's not as harsh of a of a hill back because I think when you're with people, it makes it a world of difference to go surf totally. with someone that you enjoy surfing with." And I even, you know, the person I was um, I took this morning, the client, we even talked about that. We surfed for three hours, and at the end, they were like, "Man, I didn't I didn't feel any soreness. I didn't feel any fatigue." And it was just fun. I've never surfed for three hours and like that. And part of it probably was technique, but a majority of it was we were talking the whole time. You know, it was mm-hmm. just passes the time. So super fun. Yeah, but, that's great. You're seeing clients again. Yeah, it's a blast. It's so much fun. And, uh, you know, I had the virtual going during the pandemic, but the in-person is just – and now that I'm doing one-on-one, um, it, it's just so much fun to work with people. And yeah. And surfers, you know, they're resilient. The great thing about what I do, it's all outdoors. So I do get, um, you know, we social distance. But, you know, my my thought is when you're outdoors, the the spread of the, the virus and the saturation of the, the virus molecules is a lot lower. No, I'm, on, I'm not an expert at that. But, you know, I think that um, it's a lower risk. So it's it's been great just to be outside with people and uh, that sort of thing. So super fun pumped yeah really cool stuff um you know we've been doing telehealth which is a word i can't stand uh, in the <laughs> clinic which is like video and phone consults and follow-up visits and uh you know we just started seeing in-person patients again and um the the private kind of practice that i run on the side just started kind of coming back around and you know to to what you just said like man it feels so good to like they're like don't get me wrong the whole technology thing is great we're doing this via technology and you know when we're in lockdown we can still provide a service or connect with people but there's something unsaid that will technology will never um in my mind change uh with that in-person interaction because of whatever you want to call it the energy the body language the sense of connection that uh, a human to human interaction i think provides um so I'm really happy to uh, kind of start feeling that again in my own practice because in a dozen years of practice, this by far, hands down, is the longest stretch I'd ever gone without like seeing a client or a patient. And it's yeah. like, you know, you, you, you kind of take that away and you realize like how much energy that kind of fuels your intellect and your, you know, you know, your sense of like passion in a career you know so it's it's good to start seeing that come back that's cool um so you were seeing surf clients um i uh i've had uh yeah i'm gonna start i'm a i've seen people in kaiser one-on-one and then uh, i have a few surf clients lined up uh nice. for this weekend yeah that's two. awesome yeah t- 
So how are you gonna are you gonna do it outside or at the at the private clinic? No, at the, at the private clinic I rent out. Um, yeah. we'll be the only people in there, and so we take all the CDC precautions. So more or less, it's like going to the grocery store, right? Like, yeah. uh, they get screened with questions like you know the basic stuff, cough, fever. Um, and the, I, I take their temperature and we wear masks and then we have a certain, um, disinfecting and cleaning procedure. So it's really, um, it's really interesting, but with that kind of, you know, healthcare, there's, there's going to be certain things that involve touching and getting close. So it's not a hundred percent six foot social distancing, but anything where I don't need to be like in the person's face, like when I talk to them, I'll still be six feet apart. But if I have to like assess something hands-on obviously i'm gonna like do that yeah yeah and you already had pretty high-end wipes i remember when you came and <laughs> yeah. did for the weekend here with the group and you left the wipe wipes behind you're like dude don't let the kids touch it i was like what is what do these things do like <laughs> yeah yeah you're actually like supposed to wear gloves when you use wow. them like but like i had a coworker that used them with his bare hands for like a month and i was like Hey man, what are you doing? You're supposed to wear gloves when you do it. He's like, I thought my skin was getting weird, and I was like, <laughs> Yeah, that's like, you know, that's that's toxic stuff, man. Don't you know? But yeah, that was that was like high grade, like um, uh, disinfectant. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, that's gnarly, man. Yeah. So, uh, I so I I kind of wanted to get your opinion on something. I hope you don't yeah. mind me bringing up this topic, but. Um, I wanted to talk about the science behind the quote unquote pop up. Yeah. Because uh, right now there's no science. I was going to say, uh, yeah. that's a short discussion. Yeah. Yeah. Science, it's, is there? So there's no, <laughs> there's no science, but, but there are so many different variations of how it's taught. And so I get this question a lot and I'm actually in the middle of creating a pop up course for the level twos, um, along with what you do with the level twos from a you know physiological point of view. I'm looking at it from a biomechanical point of view. And first and foremost, I'm just putting together all of the different pop-up techniques that I see. Because there's not there's not one perfect one. And then there's no science that says there is one perfect one. And it makes me think of an interview someone did with Ram Machado. Have you heard this one? About a pop up? I don't think so. Okay, so the interviewer is sitting down with Rob and he's like so Rob, how do you do your pop up? And, and Rob kind of leans back and he's just like, "I'm sorry, what?" And he's like, "Yeah, so can you break down your pop up and how you do it?" And he's looking. I'm like, "Dude, I don't know, man. Like, I just, I just get up. Mm -hmm. Like, you don't think about it." And um, I think the term pop up is a bad term. Mm -hmm. to use so what do, what do you think like what maybe how about we start out and name the different styles that people teach for the pop-up go you yeah. do one i'll do one you do one i'll do one well um yeah so i'm not a surf coach but like uh yeah there's the rudimentary approach i guess which is where you take someone to learn on a beach and then you kind of faux paddle and then you just do a quick pop-up on the sand and then the feet come to hit the ground at like the same time and the, you know uh the, the feet might kind of be pointed outward and there's just repetition of that so it's this like this kind of quick almost like burpee if you will um or jump through of yoga but it's yeah. like you know mechanically speaking uh i guess it's similar because you know in level two i teach uh like what i would i refer to as a motor control um kind of repetitive thing uh to ingrain uh flatland pop-ups but um you know doing pop-ups on the flat ground are arguably um not exactly what's happening on a surfboard maybe on a flat wave with longboard but so to keep it brief rudimentary do a bunch of repetitions feet land at the same time like in a push-up almost plyo push-up and then the right. feet swing under and boom you're up Yep. And you're yep. sideways. Your your shoulders are almost square with the stringer. Yep. So there's like uh like it's hard for beginners if they're inherently weak in their upper body to do it like this, but when it does get demonstrated at that level, it almost looks like a push up and then yeah. like a springboard pop from there. Yeah. 
And then individuals that don't have the strength to do push-ups, when they do it, they're going to almost do like a cobra pose where the spine goes into extension and then they kind of yeah. swing from there, which is harder to do on a flat ground because when when there's some sort of like incline or steepness in a wave, that board is going down there, which kind of opens up some space. So you get away with less upper body strength on a surfboard in terms of that kind of way of looking at it versus you would on flat ground. And like, you know, to go, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm kind of riffing here, but like to go to the biomechanical aspect, like, you know, I've talked with guys that are surf coaches and um, other therapists that and like surfing and they, we kind of go like, okay, we need, you need this amount of mobility uh, in the ankle. So dorsiflexion is a big topic that gets talked about. Like, you know, uh, gait, you need 10 degrees of dorsiflexion to walk normal. When you surf, the deeper you squat, uh, the more dorsiflexion you need. And so it's thought with the pop-up, you need dorsiflexion to make it happen fluidly. And and I partially believe that. I used to believe it more. But when you kind of look at what's happening on at least a short board, for sure, if the board's kind of pitching, you're now on this incline that lets you get away with less dorsiflexion to truly mm -hmm. pop up, right? It's yeah. kind of like, it's the reason why power lifters put wedges in the heels of their shoes. Right. Right? So they can squat deeper if they have stiff ankles. Yeah because they're kind of taking that out of the equation a little bit, but they need hip and knee mobility, which is like, I guess less common to have deficits there than dorsiflexion. Like it's very common to see stiff ankles for no rhyme or reason. And so the point is, is like, you know, we don't really know. There's no science on how much dorsiflexion a person needs to pop up. Yeah. My guess is you need more than zero. <laughs> um, which, which is like a flat, uh, uh, you know, it goes to neutral, but nice. like the reason why rocker bottom shoes work, uh, mechanically speaking is if people have limitations in their ankle, it changes the mechanics of the ankle. But having said that, once you get up and you, and you start riding, the more deep knee bend you get, ideally you want, you know, 10 to 20 degrees of dorsiflexion would be my best guess to like yeah. kind of crouch in a barrel. But yeah. Yeah, well, and, and it's funny, I think uh, a while back, years ago, I think I showed a picture of Machado deep in like a little mini stance, barrel stance, and his back foot dorsiflexion, he's got his his front knee almost touching the board and his back foot's totally flat. And I'm looking at it going, dude, there's no way I can get to that. Uh, and that's like what you said was like a super extreme case mm -hmm. of that. But yeah, there's yeah. the there's the extra stability, and then you've got you got different techniques on that and riding. But getting back to the pop up, so we've got push up, kind of like a push up style. Right. We've got kind of like a yoga up dog style, where you kind of almost like arch your back, cobra up. Mm -hmm. hey, I'm gonna add another one called the slide, where you kind of yep. slide your body up, and then it's almost into that up dog, like you're sliding your back foot up. No, 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 no. You're sliding your whole body. You're taking uh, your, your body and you're sliding it forward and then you're up dogging instead of okay. just pressing into the up dog. Gotcha. And so I've seen a lot of I've seen a lot of people kind of explain it that way. Um, I think you're thinking of like the chicken wing. Mm-hmm. Oh you yeah. Know, the chicken wing. It's like wing where your your leg fans out, chicken your, wing or frog yeah, your leg. Back leg fans out like a chicken wing and you mm -hmm. place the back foot and then you slide the front through. Yeah. Right. And that like there's again, there's no right or wrong way of this. I don't teach any of those because when you do something like that and you're already kind of turning your shoulder sideways, it's really hard to bring your front foot through when you're bringing it in sideways through your body. Mm -hmm. Right. And one thing that Clayton Ninaber teaches is more of like a runner's start pop up. And that's more in line with the way I teach. It's more straight in line because when you're, when you even if you just pressed up, if you keep your hips in line with your shoulders, you can, like a runner, like a start of a running race, you can bring your front leg through really easily. You know that's kind of that that, um, oh I don't know what that muscle is on your front hip. Mm -hmm. You're using a lot of that instead of the, your outside hip, which is right. if you're coming in sideways, right? Mm -hmm. And um, so I got runner start. I'm just kind of trying to name all these. And then there's mm -hmm. all these different like variations. Um, I think you and I talked about it being more kind of a 
like you said, a push away than mm-hmm. a push up or a pop up. It's like mm-hmm. you're pushing the board away instead of popping up off of it. Mm-hmm. And I, I don't, from coming from the boat world and the, the, uh, there's a basically a law on boat which basically says that you should always have three points of contact when you're on a moving vessel. So that could be your two feet and a hand on something. That could be two feet in your butt on something. But you've got to have a minimum of three points of contact to be stable and safe. Right? More is better. If you have four points of contact, great. So if you are technically popping up off of your board and you're airborne from your board, you've lost all control in that one moment. And mm-hmm. so having a point of contact or two or three at any one given time is going to provide you with more stability on that vessel. And someone that does that really interestingly at our break um, is Noah. And I have a photo of Noah, maybe I'll throw it up, where he's dropping into this really steep one. He's got his back foot planted and his front arm, his lead arm, is still on and he's bringing, he's dropping Mm -hmm. in in this like tripod stance Mm -hmm. as he's placing his front foot and angling down and Mm -hmm. making, he made it just fine. Like totally relaxed. Like the most uh, incredible picture of it. I'll have to throw it up. It's pretty, pretty awesome. But that's again, three points of contact stability, Mm -hmm. right? And, and using that momentum of the wave and not stalling out. I see a lot of people put their back foot and it really stalls out. Mm -hmm. Um, but there's like all these different subtleties. Yeah. So I, yeah, you're totally right. You know, if you teach, um, so going back to that beginner, uh, kind of way of popping up, I think oftentimes the way it's demonstrated is there is an airborne kind of characteristic where it's like, you got to like, get the hands off the pushing surface and bring the legs through. And I mean, not only is that incredibly athletic and hard to do, and when you're a beginner doing something novel, like chances are you don't have the prerequisite strength to do that. Mm -hmm. Um, So to teach it like that, I think is unfair uh, for the learner. But um, yeah, I mean, like you and I have kind of tripped out this. We've played this video and it's on my blog site. uh there's i forget his name i should know it sorry i'm the king of butchering references but uh (laughs) there is a guy who filmed uh a bunch of uh professional surfers at lemur the wave ranch and and it's it's on youtube i think if you just search popping up or or, you know slow-mo pop-up i think if you search that that's what it's called, yeah. Or you can check it out on my blog site, Second Shameless Plug. But, um, <laughs> SaltyPT.com? Yeah, yeah. No, but what's super interesting, and, and I think, um, without sounding like a broken record, like, uh, there's variances of normal movement, and that should be okay. You know, we all have different shaped hip joints and shin, you know, torsion angles and this kind of thing. So to expect everything to happen the same, and everyone is maybe probably a little bit barbaric, but, like, you know, um, each pro does it slightly different. So like if you watch them, uh, there are guys and girls that have their back foot be the first, uh, contact point really quickly too. It's like, yep. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. And, and some people have it at the same time. And then, uh, sometimes there's even quite the opposite, like the front and back. And then if you look at their hands going to like your stability aspect, some of them have like one hand coming off as that's happening. So there's like two points and some of them actually still have both hands on the board while one foot's already planted. So technically there's a moment where it's like there's three points there. So like no one's ever really no points, right? No one just bang like goes up like like running like is a point where you're airborne. Yeah. Like that doesn't really happen in that transition of popping up. So um, I do like your kind of like nomenclature of pushing down, you know, because it's like if we had to think of like closed chain versus open chain, you know, I'm going to bring it back to therapy. Yeah, baby. Um, closed, <laughs> closed chain is like a fixed surface, right? Yeah. So like, um, like doing a push up on flat ground, that's yeah. closed chain, right? The surface isn't moving and my muscles are contracting on a fixed surface. Yeah. And then we can argue swimming is somewhat 
quasi closed chain, right? The arms are moving in space, yeah. but you're 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 visualizing these ladder rungs that you're pulling. So there's a fixed ladder rung, and you're kind of pulling. Right. Now, technically, it's probably not fully closed chain, but it's not fully open chain. And if you take that kind of reasoning, popping up is probably quasi closed chain too, because when you go to push, the board's moving away from you. Right. So probably a better kind of like strength training principle although a push-up is great um might be like a bench press because you're pushing heavy load away from your body um but yeah so uh just kind of like small semantics there and then maybe the 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 more voluminous or the longer board you get on there's less pushing away of the board and the more it kind of morphs into like open to closed chain on that spectrum yeah um but just kind of like fun stuff to think about when you start incorporating into your training so if you're a short border and you're doing a bunch of push-ups which is probably just good to do for health purposes but um maybe not incorporating more quasi like or open chain kind of pushing maneuvers like a bench press yeah. maybe that's a missed opportunity for your upper body to um kind of go through some functional functional transference to a pop-up yeah. you know what i mean yeah totally and i, I i'm just imagining can you figure out a way to do more of that um, bench press style, but instead of on your back, but on your front and push down in a way if there's any sort of mechanism where we could figure that out, you know? Yeah, yeah, you know, um, that that's kind of a tough one, like maybe doing it on a ball or a, like a TRX system right. um, where there's a little bit of instability there might be a good one, you know? Um, I think a like a subtle twist to make it a bit more, I guess, functional or sport specific would be like, you know, what I've told people is like, you know, it's great doing pop ups on flat ground and it's good just to be able to do that. Um, I often think that um, so, you know, I'm going to bring it back to baseball. Um, <laughs> I, uh, so when I was in high school, I loved baseball and I read Nolan Ryan's book. And uh, if you don't know Nolan Ryan, do you remember Nolan Ryan? Oh, yeah. No hitter, man. Yep. He's the man. So, so Nolan Ryan uh, is pretty famous for being a tremendous pitcher for a long amount of time. He's also famous for getting uh, Robin Ventura in a headlock and beating a you-know-what out of him uh, when he charged the mound. But that's a, an aside. Um, but Nolan Ryan used to um, train throwing. He would take a tennis ball and he would cut it open. He would fill it with coins and then he would uh, tape it up right and so then he would like play catch with it and it was heavy yeah and so he would kind of like plyometrically train like that and um and so he would say that when he went back to playing a baseball or when he went back to throwing a baseball he felt like he was throwing like a bb you know yeah. and he felt like he could throw it harder yeah how much of it was his natural talent and how much of it was his kind of like training regimen like that not sure yeah um but it's kind of a cool concept of um, taking something and uh, uh, making it a little bit harder than what you have to do. So when you get good at it being harder with your training, it feels easier when you perform. Yeah. And I think that's what practicing a pop-up on flat ground is, is it might be harder right. and so um, than actually doing it on a, a, a kind of an object that's falling away from you to make it yeah. like to provide more real estate or clearance to bring your lower body through. But if you can do it on flat ground and it's nice and fluid, chances are you can do it fine when you have more room to work with, right? Right. But for our clients that have like stiff hips or uh, restricted dorsiflexion and just it's clunky doing it on the flat ground, it might be too advanced for them. Mm -hmm. And so for those clients, what I've said is, you know, find like a, like a slant, like a driveway and um, do it there. So like yeah. when you pop up, you have like, it's easier to kind of, uh, work on and then as your mechanics improve and your strength improves so upper body strength or hip flexor um, kind of pulling through or your hip range of motion or your ankle moves a little bit better um, maybe now it's time to decrease the slant to increase the vigor of your training kind of going back to that Nolan Ryan concept I just uh, chatted about make it harder in the training so it's easier to perform yeah, no, I've I've always kind of abided by that prescription of your training needs to be harder than your race or your performance time, um, right? And that's you know that's why X Swim the fitness program I I've sent out is so hard 
Um, it's not that you're gonna be paddling that much. It's not that you're gonna be working that hard, your heart rate that hard during a surf session. It's very rare. But again, you train hard and you come out the other end and everything's easier and more efficient. Um, Absolutely. And it's funny, like I think also combining what you were talking about with the, the mobility issues, I, I know that we've had uh, clients that they're like, yeah, I just can't do a pop-up. It's not mobile. And you've assessed them. And you're like, yeah, you've got some tension here, um, but it's doable. And you give them great exercises to help them get through that kind of hump um, psychologically. Mm-hmm. And what I'll do is to really show them that they can do it is if you start – uh, with the end in mind, if you start where where you want to end up on your board, and you go in reverse down to your stomach, mm-hmm. and whatever way you go down naturally, is kind of where your body wants to go the other way, you know, mm-hmm. minus mm-hmm. minus any explosiveness out of your upper body, but with your hips and your knees and your ankles, you know, whichever way you you kind of go from standing from your surf stance down to prone is a more natural way that your body it wants to move through Mm -hmm. and so um we work on making sure that when you go down you're 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 keeping your center of gravity over that that body and you're not leaning one way or the other just to get down to the floor because if that's happening then and you're doing that with your pop-up now now there's other issues going on that you're leaning while you're trying to get up and sure there's whole sorts of problems there but um, i think that when you do things in reverse uh, and there have been studies talking about when you do things in reverse, it helps your brain learn the new motion in, in, uh, in real time and going the correct way. Mm-hmm. Um, and mm-hmm. we've, we, I think we've had discussions outside of this, like going riding fakie, riding exactly. switch stance, riding, Yeah, I was, I was just going to bring that up. Yeah. 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 So I, I, that's great. I think you're nailing it. Um, you know, there's, if we, so there's different, maybe, um, kind of theories of incorporating some of those concepts with motor learning and in this case applying it to the pop-up so like what you're describing of like going back through the reverse order like weightlifters might call the negative and we would call it an eccentric contraction or a controlled lowering right fancy and, words yeah so it's just like saying the reverse order and um uh, physiologically, what's probably happening there is muscles can withstand or generate more force with eccentric uh, control versus con- concentric. Uh-huh. So of- oftentimes what we can do if people like um, are having pain, like let's say, you know, we're doing ankle rehab with you and you can't come up on your toes. Yeah. Right. Because like you have what pain. was happening with my foot. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. Like because you have pain in your Achilles or something. Oftentimes a little cheater trick is we can come up with both feet. So use the good foot to assist, mm-hmm. lift up the good foot. And now you're fine here. And then lowering, yeah. you're able to do it with less pain. Um, yeah, and that that little trick that you you told me sped up rehab immensely. Yeah. Like it was and insane. So, so that might be more mechanical than what you're talking about, but there is something to, uh, I think, the reverse order concept. And, um, well, and so there's and, something that actually goes on in your brain when you do that too. You're actually yeah. creating new neural pathways That's that it. help with the regular neural pathways or break uh, bad habits in that sense. Yeah, that's it. You know, um, uh, and that would be something to be super interesting to be explored of, you know, if you're regular foot or what happens when you start practicing on dry land uh, popping up goofy, you know, yeah. I think it will physically feel goofy. Um, but, uh, it, it, it might change like your speed at which you pop up normally. Yeah. Um, so an interesting concept in the world of pain research, which I think has some carryover here is there's so many like weird circuitry with our nervous system from like, um, how the brain processes information. And so like, Long story short, if I move my arm here, there's like a message going up, like sensation I'm picking up from the air touching my skin um, that's going up to the opposite side of my brain. Um, And if I'm touching it with my right hand, um, it's going to the sensory cortex. And then that information will carry, it'll jump to the motor cortex to make me react. But it's all happening opposite, right? Right. And, and so uh, if I do something right hand dominant a lot, that whole neural circuitry is probably much more refined and fast and there's more pathways versus had I do it the other way, right? Because that whole like oblique uh, contralateral system hasn't been 
practiced as much. And so what's super interesting is like, um, you know, there, there's, there's conditions out there um, that involve a lot of pain in extremity. So like uh, we, we used to call it RSD. Now it's called CRIPS or complex regional pain syndrome. And so this is a really poorly understood etiology. So like, you know, it's common for someone to, you know, hurt their hand. And next thing you know, their hand is just in chronic pain. It's really irritable and sensitive. And so a really well evidence informed approach is actually to do this thing called mirror therapy, which is to put a, uh, a mirror, um, you know, if um, we're treating my right hand, I might put a mirror there and I might put my good left hand um, on the other side of the mirror. And so when I look at the mirror, it looks like uh, I have my right hand there, even though my right hand's oh, out of the equation. Dude, I, right? I know you're, let me describe it for people that aren't seeing you. It's basically mm -hmm. you're putting the mirror right down dead center mm -hmm. of your body pointed yep. towards your right side, right? Right. And so I used to play this game of a great friend of mine growing up. We used to do that. We'd go and we'd line up the the closet mirror with our body and then we'd lift our right leg, right? Or, right. you know, and it looked like we're floating. We're like, whoa. And I did it with yeah. the kids. You got to do that with Gavin. Yeah. Because it freaks them out. They're like, whoa. Like, okay. I'll, so I'll remember please, that. Yeah, please continue. Now what you're talking about is way more fun. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so um, there is some complicated stuff going on there. So if I have chronic right hand pain, I can go, okay, like now let me touch your hand. And normally this light stimulus hurts. And now I'm the patient looking at the mirror going, hey, he's touching my right hand, yeah. but it's not hurting. And now my brain is recognizing it's not hurting. And so then we can take it a step further and then put the hand behind the mirror and do yeah. movements at the same time to kind of like, in a way, we're playing with some of that complicated neural circuitry that's happening from the synapse from the left to right side of the brain. And yeah. this has been so studied that like, we've like, uh, there's been constraint induced movement therapy and people that have had stroke where they do things like that. And next thing you know, the affected uh, 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 upper extremity that's uh, suffered paralysis starts moving a little bit better because there is that kind of cross connection. There's been strength training studies where they only do um, unilateral strengthening only to find contralateral strength change down the road. And so what that's probably saying is a lot of um, force output, as much as we love strengthening and practice, it might not be like mechanical, my muscle tissue has different cellular changes, but it might have more maybe circuitry or what we call motor units uh, behind it. Um, and we might just have a better sense of awareness. So like, you know, talking about the lack of science, there's been a ton of science on that whole like mirror neuron kind of stuff that I'm talking about. And um, yeah. a lot of it's been done by like uh, guys like Lorimer Mosley and David Butler and some of these like pe common people might know them as the NOI group, but they do uh, chronic pain research. And these guys are awesome and they've really kind of revolutionized um, the rehab world. And um, but to kind of apply it to sport, there's been nothing looking at practicing uh, opposite or, you know, whatever you want to call that, fakey um, uh, switch foot maybe, uh, uh, pop-up practice and how that relates to um, how, it, how, how it would relate to your function in normal yeah. pop-ups. But yeah, it'd but be a pretty... You're just talking about hacking the brain, which is... That's it. I think, I think that, you know, a lot of... Uh, intermediates that are 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 stuck in a rut of progression right it, I think a lot of it's mental at that point yeah they, you know we can classify so if we put that in the metal, mental category although it, we would properly say it's like neurophysiological just so people don't feel like they're making things up in their head <laughs> um, but like so there's probably some prereqs for biomechanics right you probably yeah. need a certain amount of dorsiflexion and anyone who tells you the exact amount is taking a guess right yeah. and uh we probably i take a guess you probably need 10 some odd degrees of dorsiflexion 20 degrees of dorsiflexion you probably need good knee bend not full knee bend like if you've had a total knee replacement obviously you can still pop up but if you yeah. can snake 10 more degrees out of it that'd probably be helpful right you definitely need some hip flexion especially like on the lead hip you know that needs to go you know probably somewhere around 110 120 degrees 
And then you need to have stability of the upper body to allow the lower body to sneak through. And yeah. so you should have some control there. And probably a really basic test would be like, you should be able to do three to five push ups, you know, on flat ground. And if you can't do that, you're going to lose some inherent stability there when you push away. But we couldn't, we couldn't articulate exactly how much. But going back to our Nolan Ryan concept, if you could do three to five push-ups on flat ground, consider that box checked. That's not a problem if you're having trouble popping up. It, right. it, you know, so we go through this checkbox of like dorsiflexion is good, knee flexion is good, hip flexion is good, upper, extrem upper extremity strength and stability is good. The back, if we're not having pain, should be able to go from fully uh, extended to fully rounded. Now, as human beings, we can com communicate things. So, like, if someone says, ah, my back hurts every time I go to pop up, there's probably something to that. Like, and you can start treating it with local or indirect concepts. So, stretching the low back and getting it more fluid or stretching the hips or thoracic spine um, yeah. sometimes help. But if all those concepts or all those check boxes are checked, and we're still having trouble popping up, then we really have to kind of pay attention to these like motor learning concepts of what can we do that's practice based that will help us make it more refined. Yeah, absolutely. And at that, it's like checking the box, making sure that that diagnosis isn't the problem. Once we mm -hmm. got that out of the way, we go to the kind of this other side of the motor learning side that's of right. it. And then kind of the, you know, the not, what not mental side of it but the psychology of it possibly too is are you because i've seen i've seen clients that do everything right in the pool they paddle perfectly they it's like an example to follow they paddle into waves perfectly in small waves and as soon as you get them into something that they're uncomfortable with mm -hmm. bad habits come back and it's it's that psychological barrier that they have to overcome Absolutely. I mean, if you've ever um, surfed with pain or done anything that requires performance while you have pain, it could be a really like weird predicament to be in. You can lose confidence quickly, yeah. right? Like if your back pinches every time you pop up, guess what you're not doing? You're not like going for it on steep drops because in the back of your mind, you don't want to feel the pinch and fall, right? Yeah. Like, so like that whole thing um can be really um kind of complicated too so like you know just to tr tie in some science because we're a show of math and science if we if we try to connect that to this kind of whole complicated mirror neuron um concept yeah. i'll tell you a story um back when i was uh dating my wife uh we used to uh go up to tahoe Right. And so I would drive up to Tahoe. She'd get in my Subaru Outback and I'd bump the heat and we would drive up to Tahoe and we'd go snowboarding. And and then we would like stay in a hotel and then there was a coffee shop that we like to go to and, and we'd go get a hot chocolate and a coffee and then we'd kind of snuggle up um, under this heater on a patio. Right. And so that was a really fond memory. And so like we did that. I don't know, 20 times or something when we were dating. Yeah. And then something interesting happened when my son was born or when he was about a year and a half, we went up to Tahoe in the summer Yeah. and I hadn't been to Tahoe in the summer in years. Right. Right. And so I put myself in the same environment, right? I got Trish in my, uh, on my, uh, uh passenger seat, same Subaru Outback, no heat this time. But when I got to Tahoe, Guess what my mouth was salivating for? <laughs> hot chocolate and coffee. Hot chocolate. It's 95 degrees out, and now my mouth is salivating for hot chocolate. I'm going like, why do I want a hot chocolate so bad? Yeah. And that has to do with how complicated neural circuitry can be. Yeah. So, like, you know, you can argue that's part of, like, Pavlov's dog. Yeah, op operating like, conditioning for sure. <laughs> yeah. So, it's like, you know, when we as athletes put ourselves in an environment, right, where now what we like to do, like popping up on a surfboard, is now influenced by pain. Yeah. And now every I've done all the right things, and now every time I pop up, there's pain. Yeah. Like that, man, that can be like such a complicated thing to problem solve, you know? And um, and sometimes that involves kind of changing the context. And, and I think doing some of those like um, popping up fakey concepts, these like almost like these 
you know, concepts that we use for individuals with chronic pain, but like sometimes that's enough to kind of like change the neural kind of programming to kind of go, okay, I'm doing what I like to do. I'm taking the pop-up that's got this pain connection associated with it. The PT or gym says my back is fine, my hips are fine, and all these other prereqs are marked off. What can I do to change the context to break this potential classical conditioning cycle? Yeah. You know, and so that is such a complicated thing to kind of like go into and discuss. And um, but there's so much science behind there, too, that's poorly understood, yeah. you know, um, but incorporating those concepts with your training can be really useful. We just have to be careful with like how we verbalize that to people. Yeah. You know, I so I'm thinking in my head, in my um, image driven head. Somebody that feels like they're surfing stuck at the pop-up sees the pop-up as this enormous mountain to climb and they don't have any gear to climb it. And what you're saying is going through some of these things actually makes the mountain smaller, less steep. And in a mental state, it's almost like it makes it not a big deal. And at some point when you do enough prep, when you do enough... Uh, of kind of checking the boxes that it's not this, it's not this, it's not that. It makes that hill look like just a tiny little molehill at that point. And we get back to what Rob Machado's answer was, is what do you mean you have to think about it? Like I, right. just, I just do it, right? I just and get a, up. And a lot of athletes will um, say stuff like what Rob Machado said. So like, you know, uh, baseball players that hit home runs they'll either say like i'm in such a hot streak the ball looked like it was as big as a beach ball and i was so easy to whack and then other guys will be like i have zero recollection of swinging a baseball bat right and so it's like it's so automatic for advanced athletes when they're in the groove yeah and and you can almost argue all that like classical conditioning stuff where like we're almost doing the opposite when pain's not involved right and so like you know, sometimes it can be really simple. Like I had a client that was a surfer and um, he uh, he was in his 70s and he was having a tough time popping up and he was right at that kind of like decision and surfing um, life where he was like, ah, I'm on the longboard. Now I think I'm going to go to a stand up because yeah. the pop up is just becoming a pain in the butt. And this is a really intelligent guy. He he's, was a, re- a retired uh, medical doctor and you know, we did, we kind of did the basic, like, okay, your ankles look pretty good. Your knees look pretty good. And, um, and uh, I watched him pop up on flat ground and it looked just generally clunky, but like, um, his, his lead hip was just stiff. Right. And so, um, trying to take it back to being a good coach of just doing less is more, uh, kind of ideas that we've talked about. All he did was like work on a couple techniques to mobilize his hip and it started moving better. Right. And next thing you know, he's popping up no problem, yeah, you know. Yeah. And so, um, you know, that was probably more of like a mechanical kind of block that was stopping him from popping up. He yeah. had the upper body strength. He didn't need any of the like complicated neural circuitry kind of talk. But, um, yeah, I think it's good to have a, a, a breadth of tools and where you and I kind of come in is like, being able to assess or maybe go through this mental checklist. And in one of these days I should put an Instagram post on it, but like, um, Chris Mills did a really good post or a YouTube video. Chris Mills, a surf strength coach who's doing awesome work in our kind of domain. And, um, he's a great guy to follow. Um, he went through some, uh, uh, I watched it maybe a year ago whenever he put it up, uh, just kind of similar ideas with, uh, things to go through to pop up and I loved it it was great you know and we can almost take it to that like we could take it to a deeper level with some of these like uh ulterior training concepts when people get stuck you know so there's there's tools there you know yeah no I love that that's that's awesome and I think the last kind of word because we're (laughs) running out of time again yeah um one way people can look at the pop-up is they can look at it as a maneuver now And a great guy to take a look at that does that, and he makes the pop-up artful in a way, is Corey Colapinto, Griffin's brother. Mm. Mm. Have you ever seen his longboarding videos where he, look him up, Corey Colapinto, I think it's Kuka Pinto uh, on Instagram, and he makes the pop-up look artistic, and he does different styles of it, 
He's, it's never really the same thing every time. He takes different approaches. Um, he fades. He goes down the line. He goes straight. He goes backwards. Like he does all these funky things, and he's obviously not thinking about it. But it's it's true art, and it's and it's beautiful to watch. Um, and mm-hmm. I've seen guys like Ryan Birch do something similar, and mm-hmm. and some of my friends um, down in San Diego that kind of longboard, shortboarded, they would do something similar. And it's that again that mental state of looking at the pop-up instead of as a mountain but as something that you can actually make look cool in a sense Mm -hmm. you know um so i think i think again that switch plus all the stuff that we've talked about uh, i think is going to help a lot of people kind of get over that mountain or molehill. yeah (laughs) you know i think i think it was two weeks ago we were talking about big fanning and trying to we we're talking about some of the complicated biomechanics of the spine and the uh, supination up through the spine, and I think I talked about uh, how Mick Fanning can initiate turns with his head and taking that back to simple training of how the body kind of follows. Um, and popping up can kind of be a similar concept, you know. Like I think simple things like if you look at pros do, like a lot of a lot of times, pending the wave, when those guys are pedaling in their head and vision is already looking down the wave, which mechanically is going to do a little bit of lateral flexion through the trunk and spine. Yeah. And so like trying to keep things simple of like, like looking where you want to go um, might be enough of a cue to make things happen automatically versus guys that really struggle might put so much focus into the pop-up. Yeah. They're they're looking straight down. Yeah. They're staring. You'll see beginners do that, right? It's like, and then it's like, they're just going down because they're looking down. Yeah. Right. But if they automatically turn their head, it's possible that the body could just follow a little bit easier. Super simple. Just the little tweaks, right? Awesome, man. Thank you. Um, uh, Real quick. Yeah, we got nine minutes. Segment, Wacky Wednesday Surf Style. Real quick, Mm -hmm. uh, who would you rather surf like, Mick or Joel? Oh, man. Tom Curran. (laughs) Well, I was going to say Aki or Curran, right? So between Mick or Joel, you got one that's Mm. hyper-technical and one that really is more what we would maybe define as stylish, even though Mick has style for sure. Yeah, you know, I'm I'm going to take Mick, no offense to Joel Parco, just because I love his training ethic. I think he seems like a really stand-up guy. I love everything we ch- so, chatted about. So you're, you're talking about, you're bringing in his personality into the decision now. Yeah, I guess I am, aren't right. I? He seems like a nice guy and a funny guy. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> well, who would you choose? Uh, so, so, like, it's funny that you brought that up. It's it's so hard for us to differentiate between personality and kind of what just what they're doing right so totally. if I were to just ignore personality wise uh, I would I would want to surf more like Mick more technical but yeah. he's also quite smooth in the way that he does but that's just the way that I am I'm more technical in nature so mm-hmm. so going on to the next one Aki or Kern which both of these guys serve vastly different than those two mm-hmm. so Aki or Kern well, no offense to Aki, but in my mind, no one stands a chance if you give me that concept of current yeah, on the yeah. table. So. I'm a, I, I agree with that one. And Aki, um, his backside, you know who, who reminds me of it um, now is um, Caroline Marks. Exactly. Dude. Yeah. It, she's had that comparison a lot. Holy I mean, smokes. But the backside is just like, there's something about it. But other than that, yeah. I, I, the style wise, I'm not a, I've never really been a fan of the Aki style, even though it's super powerful uh, both both ways, but yeah, I, I agree. I think style wise, that's gonna be tough. But if you look at if you add in personality into that, oh yeah, Aki all the way. Yeah, well, you know? <laughs> I mean, Aki is like the coolest cat of all time. Yeah, I mean, yeah totally, hundred like, percent. Yeah. So now, like the ultimate, would you who would you rather surf like? And in this one's, I think a tough one is Gabriel or John John. Hmm. Well, I'm I'm biased to go with any regular footer. Um, <laughs> if we took if we took if we took personality away, because you know either yeah, we'll kind of leave that over there. Um, but I I would still go with John John. You know, yeah. I think um, the guy they're both incredible. But yeah. um, 
there are certain things that I think John John has that are kind of like unique to himself. Like yeah. I think he used to get a lot of um, kind of negative feedback for like his roundhouse cutbacks when he, you know, was first coming on the scene as a pro. Um, he wasn't really completing his turns, and now he's kind of like he's got so much talent. He does a really unique turn um, yeah. with his roundhouse, just with how his upper body is and where his head is, and yeah. it's subtle. But like I think uh, there's a lot of unique characteristics to um john john surfing that have like he's actually in my mind made like more desirable and stylish like like now there's guys like trying to copy his unique turn so yeah. um obviously medina is very talented but i think yeah i would still take john john yeah i'm gonna i'm gonna go the opposite way i'm gonna go gabriel uh -oh. and, and, and even with personality involved i i think gabriel's actually deep down a really good guy um i think he's a competitor and when he gets in that situation that's that's what he's doing he's competing but um i've when john john came on the scene especially his style i actually kind of had a problem with it um it mm -hmm. felt stiff it felt like he was mm -hmm. like kind of like balled up his hands whenever he'd move mm -hmm. now it's incredible and you said it perfectly it's very unique mm -hmm. it's so in it's so individualized and unique to him that uh, again it's one of those things where i would uh, i mean i guess if you could just copy and paste it would be super cool but i feel like i totally screwed up <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, whereas mm -hmm. whereas gabriel feels like when i watch gabriel surf even though sometimes it's very robotic like at lamore like you know the backflip's coming mm -hmm. um and he it, it's almost like watching sean white at you know x games do a half, po half pipe run you know it he's done it a million times so that's the kind of the downside, but his arsenal of ease of movement and his lightness on his feet is something that I would want to emulate. Just that, mm -hmm. just that, and mm -hmm. he's very, um, I think, smooth in the way that he does certain things, and I'm, it blows me away. I think we've only seen a fraction of what he really can do, and we never see free surfing of him mm -hmm. all that much. So who knows what he's doing behind closed doors? I think he's dating models behind closed doors. <laughs> possibly, possibly, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, anyway, yeah, no, I, hypotheticals yeah. are fun. Yeah, no, I, uh, I, uh, I agree with you. I think, um, well, I, I'd still take John John, but what you're saying I think is 100% accurate. Uh, Medina's so technical in like, I think you can watch Medina and John John do the same maneuver, but there's just something uh, slightly different with how John John's body posture is and what he's doing with his hand and you know really silly superficial things like that that um uh, uh style critics will kind of look at but um yeah. yeah i think uh yeah it's a good debate and it's sure. funny like uh when it comes down to that i think i i don't want to stand out <laughs> so maybe that's why i choose yeah. a mick and a gabriel i want to be you know more technical and be, you know maybe not stand out as much <laughs> yeah we'll we'll leave we'll leave that we'll leave that yeah, right there there's a lot a, of the psychology behind that a whole bunch of problems <laughs> with my with me yeah no, well um good. but thanks uh thanks for joining us guys uh once again we've killed an hour of your life hope you enjoyed it uh send us some emails um any questions that you have and get a hold of us saltypt.com and surfingpatline.com until next time uh we'll see you in the water See you guys.